In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, dear fellow redeemed by the blood of Christ. What expectation do you have of your pastor? For you have expectations of him. In every area of life, you have expectations. As an example, you expect your work to pay you and treat you properly if you faithfully do what they hired you to do. You expect the restaurant to prepare the food the way you ordered it and for your Amazon package to arrive on time and not be broken. You expect your friends to be there for you in time of need. You expect your family to show you love and compassion. Yes, in almost er every area of life, you have expectations. In almost every area, you expect something from someone. And so, what expectation do you have of your pastor? Are you uncomfortable with that question? Are you uncomfortable thinking of what expectation you have of your pastor, uh, especially here at church during a sermon? For most of the time during the sermon, it works the other way, right? You're hearing the expectations that God has of you. You're hearing how he expects you to fulfill his holy law. You're hearing how he expects you to repent when you disobey him. And you're hearing how he expects you to cling to him by faith and trust in his promise of forgiveness, which he won for you by his bloody death and glorious resurrection, so that you can be forgiven of all your sins and given eternal life in heaven. Yes, normally you're hearing what God expects of you. But today all the readings focus on the holy ministry. You heard it. You heard about the prophet Amos or Titus and the other overseers or the 12 apostles. And while it's easy to quickly dismiss these readings thinking, well, they don't really apply to me since I'm not a pastor, let's not be so quick as to dismiss these readings or the theme of this entire service. Because when you hear what God expects of his ministers, you're also hearing what you can expect of them. And what you can expect of them actually brings you great comfort. For look at our text, our gospel lesson from St. Mark, which is the first account that we have of Jesus sending out the 12 apostles. You see, before this, the apostles were being trained by Jesus. Jesus was training them to be his called workers, so to speak. And he had been training them in two ways. First, they were eyewitnesses to everything he taught and did. And so when Jesus was teaching in parables, such as those seed parables we heard about a couple of weeks ago, or when Jesus would perform a miracle, such as calming the wind and the waves, the disciples were right there. They were hearing what Jesus was teaching. They were seeing what Jesus could do. And they were growing in their knowledge and faith about who Jesus was and why he had come into the world. That's the first way that Jesus was training his apostles. And the second way? Well, the second way was privately. For as they walked around from town to town, village to village, can you imagine all the conversations that they had? Conversations where either formerly or informally, Jesus would proclaim to him that he is the Christ, the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. Yes, for almost two years now, these 12 had been following Jesus around, and Jesus had been training them, teaching them, for they were going to be the leaders of the early church, especially after Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension to his Father's right hand. But before all of that would happen, before Jesus would win salvation and then ascend to his Father's right hand, Jesus wanted to give these 12 some practical experience. So what did he do in our text? He sent them out. 
He sent them out to be his apostles, for that's what apostle means. It means someone sent out in a special way by Jesus. And when Jesus sent out these 12 apostles, what happened? Some pretty incredible things. Listen to how St. Mark describes the work of the 12 apostles. He said, they went out and preached that people should repent. They also drove out many demons. They anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Pretty incredible what they did, right? And so, is this what you can expect from your pastor? For after all, your pastor has been trained like the 12 apostles. Oh, oh, sure, our pastors in our synod, they don't follow Jesus around on foot from town to town, but for four years of college and especially four years of a seminary, they sit at Jesus' feet studying his word, growing in their faith and knowledge about who Jesus is and why he came into the world. I hope I'm not boasting by saying this, but I'll put our seminary training in our synod against anyone. It's second to none. So since your pastor, whoever he may be, since he has been trained, should you expect him to do what the 12 apostles did in our text? Should you expect your pastor to preach a message of repentance, drive out demons, and heal people? In a word? Yes. This is exactly what you can expect your pastor, whoever he may be, to do. You should expect your pastor to preach a message of repentance. For the message of repentance is the heart and core of all of Scripture. It's the heart and core of everything Jesus did. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but all are justified freely by the grace of God who became a man and suffered and died as the atoning sacrifice for sin, so that all your sins, whatever they may be, can be removed from you. For whenever you are brought to faith and repentance over your sins, you are washed in the blood of Christ and your sins are removed from you. Yes, the message of repentance is the heart and core of Scripture. It's the heart and core of everything that Jesus did. And so you can expect that it'll be the heart and core of what your pastor does. Or whether he's preaching a sermon or teaching a class or talking in the office, you should expect it should be about repentance, it be about the forgiveness of sins which Christ freely won for you. And if your pastor is not focusing on repentance, you should call him out on it. You have every right to call him out on it. He's not doing what you should expect him to do. When your pastor, whoever it may be, is preaching that message of repentance, that message of free forgiveness found in Jesus, then, well, then you can expect something else from him. And what you can expect is actually pretty incredible. You can expect that when your pastor preaches that message of repentance, whether it be from the pulpit or in a classroom or just one-on-one, -on -one, you can expect that Satan and his demons will be driven far away from you and that you will be healed. And does that surprise you? Does it surprise you that that is what you can expect from your pastor when he preaches a message of repentance? For after all, your pastor is a human being and a sinful human being at that. He has no power over Satan and his demons. On top of that, I doubt that you have come to a service and seen a pastor lay his hands on somebody or sprinkle them with oil so that they're healed from cancer or some other sickness. No mere human being has that type of power. And so how then can I say that you should expect your pastor to be able to drive the demons away from you and heal you? Well, to answer that question, let's look at the very first verse of our text. I think this verse is important. We read, Jesus called the 12 and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Did you catch why these 12 apostles were able to do such great things when they preached that message from Jesus? 
It's all because they were sent out by Jesus. They were sent out by Jesus with Jesus' power. None of the 12 on their own had the power to do anything great. But Jesus sent them out. He sent them out with his power. That's how they were able to do such great things. And do you know what? That's how God's ministers are able to do such great things today. For through the divine call and the calling process, they're being sent out by Jesus. You see, this is the whole comfort in the divine call and the calling process. At first, that whole process of receiving a call or getting a call might seem strange to you. It's different than almost anything else that we do in this world. For a pastor doesn't know he's on a call list when a church needs a pastor and is calling him. He's not applying for jobs thinking, oh, this is where my strengths or weaknesses lie. If he did that, he probably would have some sort of sinful motivation. On top of that, when a church calls a pastor, they don't really have a whole lot of information about him. They got one little sheet of paper. How are you supposed to know what pastor's right for your congregation based on one little sheet of paper? Finally, when your pastor receives a call, it's easy to think, what are they doing? Don't they know that we need a pastor too? Why are they trying to steal their pastor from us? Or... If you're in a vacancy and issuing calls, it's easy to say, can't we sweeten up the pot a little bit to convince someone to come? There can be a whole lot of misconceptions when it comes to the divine call. But my dear friends in Christ, here's the amazing comfort through the divine call and the entire calling process. Through the call, Jesus is at work. Jesus is sending out his pastors through the call, just like he did with the 12 in our text. For let's go back to our text just for a brief moment. Notice that these 12, they didn't have much of an opinion of where they went. (laughs) Rather, Jesus sent them out. They didn't know where they were going until Jesus sent them out to the right town. On top of that, that town didn't even know who they were getting, right? Until one of them came preaching a message of repentance. Neither the apostle nor the town was in control of the situation. But Jesus was in control of it, sending the right apostle to the right town, for he knew which of the 12 apostles should go to which town so that they could preach that message of repentance, drive out demons, and heal people. He was in control of the entire situation. And through the call and the calling process, our Savior Jesus is in control of the entire situation. He's sending the right man to be pastor of the right church for the right amount of time. He's in control of it all. And that's the way it has to be. Because since your pastor is called by Christ, sent by Christ, you now can have some great expectations of him. You can expect that when your pastor baptizes your babies or when he proclaims absolution, that Satan really will be driven out of you. And you'll be made a child of God, not by the pastor's power, but because he was sent by Christ. And you can expect that when the pastor places God's body and blood on your tongues, you can expect that your sins really will be forgiven and you will be made holy. Again, not by the pastor's power, but by the power of Christ. And when your pastor stands in a pulpit and preaches or teaches in a classroom or talks with you one-on-one, you can expect that you will be healed from your greatest disease healed of all your sins and made worthy for eternal life in heaven, again, not by his power, but by the power of Christ. Do you see the comfort that you receive when you recognize what you can expect from your pastor? For no matter who your pastor is or how long he stays, 
or what strengths or what weaknesses he has, and every pastor has different strengths and weaknesses, you can be confident that he was sent by Christ, called by Christ. It's part of the Lutheran confessions. You are not allowed to be a pastor unless you are properly called. And since your pastor, whoever it may be, has been called by Christ and sent by Christ, you can expect him to do great things. No, not grow the church. That's not in his abilities. But you can expect him to preach that message of repentance, that message that Jesus proclaimed. And when your pastor, whoever that is, preaches that message, Satan will be driven far you, far from you, and you will be healed and made worthy enough for eternal life. That's what you can expect from your pastor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.